James and the Giant Peach, Chapter 38. Five minutes later, they were all safely down, and James was excitedly telling his story to a group of flabbergasted officials. And suddenly, everyone who had come over on the peach was a hero. They were all escorted to the steps of City Hall, where the mayor of New York made a speech of welcome. And while doing this, 100 steeplejacks, armed with ropes and ladders and pulleys, swarmed up to the top of the Empire State Building and lifted the giant peach off of the spike and lowered it to the ground. Now the mayor shouted, we must have a ticker tape parade for our wonderful visitors. And so a procession was formed, and in the leading car, which was an enormous open limousine, sat James and all his friends. Next came the giant peach itself. Men with cranes and hooks had quickly hoisted into a very large truck, and there now it sat, looking just as huge and proud and brave as ever. There was, of course, a bit of a hole in the bottom where the spike of the Empire State Building had gone in. But who cared about that? Or indeed, about the peach juice that was dripping out of it onto the street. Behind the peach, skidding about all over the place in the peach juice, came the mayor's limousine. And behind the mayor's limousine came about 20 other limousines carrying all the important people of the city. And the crowds went wild with excitement. They leaned out of the windows of the skyscrapers, cheering and yelling and screaming and clapping and throwing out bits of white paper and ticker tape. And James and his friends stood up in their car and waved back to them as they went by. Then a rather curious thing happened. The procession was moving slowly along Fifth Avenue when suddenly a little girl in a red dress came running out from the crowd shouting, Oh, James, James, can I please have a tiny taste of your marvelous peach? Help yourself, James shouted back. Eat all you want. It won't keep forever anyway. No sooner had he said this than about 50 other children exploded out of the crowd and came running into the street. Can we have some too, they cried. Of course you can, James answered. Everyone can have some. The children jumped onto the truck and swarmed like ants all over the giant peach, eating and eating to their heart's content. And as the news of what was happening spread quickly from street to street, more and more boys and girls came running from all directions to join the feast. Soon there was a trail of children a mile long chasing after the peach as it proceeded slowly up Fifth Avenue. Really, it was a fantastic sight. To some people, it looked as though the Pied Piper of Hamlin had suddenly descended upon New York. And to James, who had never dreamed that there could be so many children as this in the world, was the most marvelous thing that had ever happened. By the time the procession was over, the whole gigantic fruit had been completely eaten up, and only the big brown stone in the middle, licked clean and shiny by 10,000 eager little tongues, was left standing on the truck. Chapter 39 And thus the journey ended, but the travelers lived on. Every one of them became rich and successful in the new country. The centipede was made vice president in charge of sales of a high-class firm of boot and shoe manufacturers. The earthworm with his lovely pink skin was employed by a company that made women's face creams to speak commercials on television. The silkworm and Miss Spider, after they had both been taught to make nylon thread instead of silk, set up a factory together and made ropes for tightrope walkers. The glowworm became a light inside the torch of the Statue of Liberty and thus saved a grateful city from having to pay a huge electricity bill every year. The Old Green Grasshopper became a member of the New York Sympathy, Sympathy, Symphony Orchestra, where he was playing, was greatly admired. The Ladybug, who had been haunted all her life by the fear that her house was on fire and her children all gone, married the head of the fire department and lived happily, happily ever after. And as for the enormous, enormous peach stone, it was set up permanently in place of honor in Central Park and a famous monument. But it was not only a famous monument, it was also a famous house. And inside the famous house, there lived a very famous person, James Henry Trotter himself. And all you had to do any day of the week was go and knock upon the door, and the door would always be open for you, and you would always be asked to come inside and see the famous room where James had first met his friends. And sometimes, if you were lucky, you would find the old green grasshopper in there as well resting peacefully in a chair before the fire. Or perhaps it would be the ladybug who had dropped in for a cup of tea and gossip. 
or the centipede to show off his new batch of particularly elegant boots that he had just acquired. Every day of the week, hundreds and hundreds of children from afar and near came pouring into the city to see the marvelous peach stone in the park. And James Henry Trotter, who once, if you remember, had been the saddest and loneliest little boy that you could find, now had all the friends and playmates in the world. And because of so many of them were always begging to tell and him to tell and tell the story again of his adventures on the peach, he thought it would be nice if one day he sat down and wrote a book. So he did. And that is what you've just finished reading. The end. <laughs>